Now, do you consider your dominant wind for your area when setting up a stand? And we'll talk about that in a little bit. What is a dominant wind? Um, and I think a lot of you'd be surprised on what it actually is for your area. The bottom line is, how do you set your stands up? You know, there's been talk, uh, I get questions all the time. Do you set your stand up for your dominant winds? Uh, do you look for stands? Do you actively seek stands for your dominant wind pattern when it comes to hunting season? Or, you know, I talk about hunting great weather days. You know, most of my bucks are killed on seven, eight, nine, ten 10 out of 10 days when it comes to the hunt cast on HuntWise and that algorithm that's built into that, that I came up with. That's the algorithm. That's what I hunt. I, I have all weather whitetail buck. I hunt by the weather. That's what I do. And so someone might say, well, you want to have a lot of northwest wind spots or west northwest wind or north northwest. And um, I like those. You have to have them. But at the same time, I'm not going into stand locations saying this is my dominant wind. This is the best wind to hunt. So I need these. Or I don't have this wind, so I need to hunt this, or I need to find a stand. I think when you go in looking for certain wind direction stands to hunt, you set yourself up for failure. And I would give into what I do on client properties, when I'm looking at my own land, to me this is the perfect setup. I even said to Dylan, what stand do you think would be the perfect setup? And we were both thinking the same stand location, this region around here, uh, to talk about this, because it's very clean. And what I mean by that, it's, it's easy to illustrate, we have a big bank of switchgrass on the outside. So that switchgrass will be six, eight feet. It's already over two feet tall coming through it. It's, it's already coming in just beautiful. Uh, this is the fourth growing season for that switch. So we have our access blocked coming in here. Now, when we get into the woods, the further we get into the woods, the, the more of a chance we have spooking deer. So I'd rather get to a location where, for example, we have a trail that crosses right here. That trail is right in this location. That's the top trail. I don't want to try to block this off because it's, it is a good movement through here. But I'm going to put my stand on the uphill side of it, which is going to be in that oak right there. So with that oak tree right back here, yeah, we're five, 10 feet in front of that is this trail, but I access on the back side of that oak. I climb up the back side and then I sit in, I'll sit in facing this way so I can shoot with my right hand down in a seated position. So literally to get to that oak, I'm walking in the woods less than 20 yards, 15 yards. Now the cool thing about that is there's a bench behind Dylan. What that bench does is it allows me to come in and if there's deer down below that bench, because of the drop off there, they can't see me coming in. So literally very, very little exposure coming into this location. Now, like I said, there's a bench and it's a beautiful bench. It, it goes steep down below. So because of that drop off, deer, deer are either way down hundred yards below or they're sitting right here and moving in this location. You can see how wide the bench is right here. Now water hole or not, you know, it's a good hunting spot. And I'll add that when we add a mock scrape, we add a water hole, we do it in a spot where there's already deer movement. We're not trying to reinvent the wheel. I don't want to bring deer all the way up there when their natural movement pattern is right here. So we have shots that we can develop down here. We'll have a 22, 23 yard shot, 20 yard shot, 23 yard shot. We'll have three legs down here. We are hunting this movement. It's a very, very strong movement. So we have a reveal camera right over there. We'll add a mock scrape to this location that we can shoot at probably right, right behind Dylan here. And we have everything coming together here. We have great access. We have switchgrass screened up top. Now maybe you're on public land and you're using the backside of a ridge to get into a stand. You think the deer are on the other side. So you're using the ridge to block your access. You get into a tree, look down, you're blind, whatever you're doing, but you're using that hidden access like we have here. We have perfect movement right here where deer are really funneled in on this bench. In fact, this is one of the more narrow areas where it widens out the further it goes behind Dylan and then it widens out into a bedding area. We have a bedding area that way about 150 yards and about a bedding area that way about 150 yards. So we're coming into that bow tie movement I talk about where it's a concentration, it's the thinnest part of the movement. We don't expect deer bedding here. They're either there or over there. We can come in and out without spooking deer. And then we added the water hole. So it's a great spot for water hole. We have a nice clearing. I don't like where deer feel combined. I don't want them putting their, their body down into a hole and they can't see out. Um, you can see we've pushed all the logs and debris off to the side. So deer feel comfortable coming in here. They don't have uh, constriction all the way around where they can't see out when they're actually taking a drink. So a big 300 gallon water hole, pretty easy. We chose it to accent this stand. 
And I like this because we don't have deer bedding nearby here. It's just a pass through. So perfect for rut cruising, perfect for deer that are going to a smaller food plot there to a bigger one and then to a really big one. So we have that movement. Perfect for daytime cruising where a buck's coming up on this ridge system and then going back, we have bedding down below. We actually have a water hole way down below. It's by about 400, 500 yards, but 300 feet in elevation down. So, <coughs> excuse me. But we actually have really good bedding area down there. There's a distant neighbor food source. So there's perfect rut cruising, puts us in that position of a lot of buck movement. So you can see we have that bow tie movement. We have a lot going on. What have I not talked about? You know, kind of the title with this, with this video is we're talking about hunting predominant winds and hunting that dominant wind and how you set up your stands based on that wind. Notice I didn't talk about wind direction. I didn't talk about what way we're even facing. It's because I don't care. And what I mean by that, is you ultimately have to care when you come and sit in here, but I don't care when I'm setting this up. I'm looking at this setup. It wouldn't matter if it's public or private land. There's a lot going on here for why I am sitting in this location. I'm sitting in because of this movement. You know, of course, we added the water hole to accent it. We'll add a mock scrape. I have great access in and out. It's a pinch point where it gets wider on this side, wider on that side, bedding areas in the distance, just top of the ridge system. This is where bucks cruise. Lots of historical sign, old rubs, old scrapes. So there's a lot of reason to come through here. I'm looking at that. I'm looking at how I can get in and out of this area without spooking deer. I'm not crossing the movement to sit over here, thinking I'm gonna hunt with my wind going that way, out over the hollow. Instead, I'm hunting the safe side. I'm hunting an ex exceptional movement. And then I look at it, I'll pull up hunt wise, I'll look at my aerial photo and I'll say, okay, now which way is the wind blowing? Because I can't have a blow down here. So then I look at it like I need to blow out there. That's the wind direction I need to go, which is southerly. It's gonna be southeasterly, southwesterly, south. Figure out your stand location first, figure out the movement only think of that and then the very last step is this is the perfect setup what wind direction do i need to hunt it and what you'll find is if you're setting up your property or your hunt on public land effectively you're going to have areas where this is a great movement i can come in from this side on public land hunt this outside of the movement I come in from this side hunt this side i can go over to that bedding over there and i can hunt the back side of that i can go to this food source maybe an oak flat on public land a food plot on private land i can hunt the back side of that and get in and out without spooking deer it's all about that no matter where you sit all of a sudden you start looking at well i have a back side of bedding over there i have the side of the movement here i have bedding area over there i have a distant food source over there that i can hunt and it's all that same collection of deer and movement kind of the same herd you start thinking man I have south, south winds here, north winds off that point on the back side of bedding, southerly winds, westerly winds over there on that side of the food source as the field edge takes a trip around. And when you start hunting a movement effectively and really working on your access and not spooking deer, you find that you take advantage of the funnels and the movements that you naturally have or that you're building. And then you think about the wind direction. What's kind of cool is in the end, if you do it right, you end up having a typical 40 acre parcel we see or 100 acres. We'll have nine, 11, 12 stands, eight stands. You'll have three or four for every single wind direction on that side of the property. Always choose your spots based on where you expect to kill deer, how you can access, how you can get in without spooking deer. There's value in the spot. In this case, the inside of a bow tie expanding between, between uh, bedding areas. We have a lot going on here. And then you just have to ask yourself, what wind direction can I hunt this with? The wind direction you hunt your stand with, you determine last. And it's after you've put everything together, including your great approach and why bucks are cruising there in the first place. The last step, what wind do I need to hunt? We set this up and you can bet we'll be back this fall. We'll try to share it with you. And uh, we can't wait to sit here. There's a new water hole. Uh, you can imagine the excitement when we come in here. We're already getting good buck movement pictures. Lots of critters, fawns, does here. Um, in this location and you can't you can bet that we can't wait to come back in here some October late September November set or two or three or four because we can hunt this over and over again too we're not spooking deer so you don't have to rely on that first set that's in another video the bottom line is we'll be back here this fall we'll bring it to you and I hope you can apply how you approach winds and setups to wherever you're hunting public or private land for this fall and I think that'll keep you out of trouble keep you on the straight and narrow for finding a great stand location and determining your wind you need to sit with it in that stand location this fall.
Hey folks, I really appreciate you watching and I want to invite you to check out our main website, whitetailhabitatsolutions.com. I'm going to miss all these, but we have seed to offer, hats, articles, web classes, books, consultations, and even a new podcast. I think we have 17 podcasts out there right now for you to listen to. So we have a lot to offer. Most of all, if you don't want to buy anything, I'm going to keep offering free videos, free articles. We have over 600 articles on the site. And uh, most of all, thank you very much for watching, reading, listening, being a part of White to Habitat Solutions. If you want to check this stuff out, awesome. Links are in the description.